has been the most remarkable thing in the last 24 hours is, in essence, the president's team putting forward the First Amendment defense. Because I don't know. I'm not a constitutional lawyer. And, and, and maybe maybe they're right that, you know, if you're going to prosecute right. people for false information, then you have to prosecute Democrat elected officials, too. But right. that's a giant shift from two and a half years of telling the American people the election was stolen. I have the facts. I just never got to present my case because Congress wouldn't hear it or the courts wouldn't hear it. If that was the case, he could walk in now and present it and the conspiracies would go away. But if instead they're saying, look, everyone has a First Amendment right to mislead the American people, well, then obviously he's been misleading the American people and misleading about what the vice president's role was. That's a good point. That's Mark Short, the former chief of staff to Vice President Mike Pence, weighing in on Trump's latest indictment and the legal defense the former president's lawyers are expected to use and already have been using in public appearances on TV. Joining us now, Democratic Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut. He is a member of the Judiciary Committee. Senator, it's good to see you. A lot to talk with you about, including this indictment. We were just discussing some of the details of it. We're going to see a former president of the United States arraigned today on charges effectively that he attempted anyway to overturn the results of the election and to lead people to the Capitol on that terrible day back in January of 2021. What jumped out to you as you read through this indictment? What jumped out to me is, and it can't be repeated too often, no one is above the law. And that quote from Trump to Pence, you're too honest, is haunting in a way. But equally so, having lived through that January 6th riot, now to watch Donald Trump appear before a court just down the block is going to be profoundly moving. The terror of that day, the damage that it did to real lives, people injured and killed, Capitol Police, there were real consequences. And, you know, our democracy doesn't exist by magic. It's not a default state of being. It takes institutions and people who are willing to work, speak up, stand up for it. And we're going to see a test of that democracy because Donald Trump was not indicted by Merrick Garland or Joe Biden. He was indicted by a grand jury, ordinary everyday Americans who were offended by what he did on January 6th and how he incited the mob and how he engaged in that conspiracy. So I think that we're going to learn a lot about our democracy and hopefully it will be upheld. Many of the people who were in that building with you on that day on January 6th, mostly or all of them Republicans, have sort of backed off their criticism of Donald Trump. Senator Tim Scott, one of your colleagues, I know he's well liked in the Senate, came out yesterday when this indictment came down and said this is President Biden weaponizing the DOJ. He knows better, of course. He was there. He knows what happened that day. He knows what Donald Trump did. So in your private conversations with Republicans, things they may not say out loud because they fear Donald Trump's voters, what are their true feelings about all of this and what we're about to see in this trial? There's no love lost in the United States Senate for Donald Trump among Republicans as well as Democrats. And, you know, having lived through that day, when we were all aghast, frightened, terrorized, as we fled the Capitol, literally walked and sometimes ran and saw and heard the mob outside, saw through the windows, heard them in the building. And then we gathered in one of the hearing rooms, guarded by the, not just the Capitol Police, but the National Guard, we made the decision to go back and count the vote, Republicans, Democrats together. And unfortunately, that sense of purpose has been dissipated since then. And uh, I am really disappointed that some of my Republican colleagues haven't been stronger in what they've said publicly about Donald Trump. So, Senator, much of that uh, fear to do so is fueled, though, by just how popular Trump remains among Republican voters. He's he's leading every poll. Uh, his numbers seem to only go up uh, when he gets indicted again. What does that say to you just right now? I mean, there are people in your state who, of course, who love Donald Trump. There are people in every state who does. What does that say to you about just where we are right now as a, as a nation? Uh, I want to go back to a point that Mika made earlier because I think it's a really serious one. Put aside the politics. If you look at the intelligence reports these days in the United States of America, the most persistent and lethal threat to our internal security is violent extremism. 
it is no longer the terrorist who's going to fly an airplane into some building. It is within our country people, extremists, white supremacists, and others who would resort to violence to alter an election or take other kinds of violent action. So this trial is going to be a real test of our democracy. And in a world where democracy is increasingly under threat, it will be a real opportunity for the United States of America to show that no one is above the law. He's entitled to his rights, just like any criminal defendant. He's presumed innocent until proven guilty. But the criminal justice system has to be allowed to work without interference. We need to prevent interference and this kind of violent extremism. So, Senator, there, there seem to be barriers to showing, as you just pointed out, uh, American citizens the process of democracy, the process of a trial. We were talking earlier, but 50 years ago this week, the Watergate hearings were going on. Bob Haldeman testified before Sam Irvin's committee. The entire nation, you remember this, the entire nation was glued to those hearings. And it was an educational opportunity for people not ordinarily mixing with politics or government to find out what was happening. So how is it that 50 years later, with perhaps, arguably, the most important federal trial ever to occur within the United States judicial system, one man, John Roberts, has the ability to say, put it on TV, put this trial on TV, with all the facts, the defendants, the prosecution, here are the questions, here are the answers. Why not one man stands between the public being educated and not being educated? I think that's a really important point, Mike. And you know the old saying, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Sunlight is really necessary here because, number one, without it, the American people are going to have a distorted picture. As good as the reporting will be, it still won't be sufficient to overcome what the defense lawyers say as they come out of the courtroom and they face the press, which the prosecution can't do under mm -hmm. ethical constraints. Number two, I have long supported, in fact, introduced legislation to open the federal courts to cameras, including the United States Supreme Court, where the Chief Justice sits. And there is no excuse, in my humble opinion, for the Chief Justice of the United States failing to open this courtroom because the American people need and deserve to see what goes on in this trial. And there is also no excuse, by the way, for the United States Chief Justice failing to impose an ethical code of conduct for the United States Supreme Court. It is the only court, I was talking yesterday to one of our most respected federal judges, the only court that has no code of ethics. The only judges are members of the Supreme Court. They are answerable to no one. And I think the Chief Justice could diffuse this issue by imposing a code of conduct this afternoon on the United States Supreme Court. And we've seen in reporting for the last couple of months the impact of all of that and some of the benefits that uh, members of the Supreme Court have received. Senator.